Welcome to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation CF Education Day webcast, Constipation and DIOS in Cystic Fibrosis. I'm Leslie Hazel, Director of Patient Resources at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. This webcast is hosted by the Foundation and supported through an unrestricted educational grant from Genentech. To hear an update related to CF liver disease, CF clinical research, CF related diabetes, lung health, lung disease, infection control, and more, please watch an archive webcast on the Foundation's website. This presentation will answer questions related to constipation and distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, or DOS, in cystic fibrosis. These questions came from you, the CF community. Questions not related to this topic or that ask for medical advice will not be asked or answered. To learn more or if you have additional questions, I strongly encourage you to talk to the doctors and staff at your CF care center or you can contact the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation at 800-FIGHT-CF or info at cff.org. Joining me is Dr. Sarah Jane Schwarzenberg, who's a gastroenterologist and associate professor at Amplet's Children's Hospital at the University of Minnesota. So, Sarah Jane, we know CF affects the liver and affects the pancreas, mm -hmm. but does it affect the intestines and how? Yes, CF affects the entire intestinal tract. Um, CF can lead to many different problems in the intestinal tract, including constipation and distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, but it can also contribute to the development of small bowel overgrowth, in a susception, rectal prolapse, um, and other problems in the GI tract. So one of the questions that came in was somebody randomly gets constipated. Mm -hmm. They want to know, does this have to do with their CF or does this happen to people in general? And you know, if it, how does, con how does CF contribute to it in any way if it does? There's a lot of constipation in the general community. Um, I think that's evidenced by how many medicines we have for it in drugstores. Mm -hmm. uh, but the CF population seems to be particularly at risk. Some people have estimated that as many as 50% of children have constipation with CF from time to time. Um, I think this is because people with CF tend to have dehydrated stool. Mm -hmm. um, it requires a lot of fluid and, and a lot of fluid drinking through the day to keep your stool soft and keep a lot of water in it. And there's a lot of other places where pe people with CF lose water. They lose it in their sweat, they lose it when they're breathing, uh, breathing more rapidly or breathing more heavily, and that can dry out their stool and lead to constipation. So my question is, and I'm sure some other people is, what is constipation? You hear, I've heard my grandparents talk about it, you know, what is it? Can you kind of describe it? Sure. Um, the Europeans um, have developed a definition of constipation that they initially considered as a um, resource for research, but I think it provides people a little bit of guidance in what, what, they, what the definition of constipation really is. Um, in the European definition, abdominal pain and or abdominal distension that is combined with a reduced frequency mm -hmm. or an increased consistency, that is more hardness of the stools, occurring over a fairly long period of time, a few weeks or a few months. And these symptoms have to be relieved by laxatives in order for you to say that that's constipation. Because a lot of other things could cause somewhat similar symptoms. Right, so what is the best way to prevent constipation? From my understanding, it all boils down to keeping the stool as soft as possible. Mm -hmm. And the two things that do that are a lot of fluid and moving the stool out of the colon every day. The colon is designed to remove water from the stool. Mm -hmm. So as long, the longer the stool remains there, the more likely it is to become drier and harder to pass. So for people with cystic fibrosis, drinking a lot of water, keeping well hydrated is really important. Um, and I say water, but it could be water, it could be other fluids, it could be vegetables and fruits that have a lot of water in them. Mm -hmm. um, using uh, medicines like uh, fiber containing medicines or um, Miralax, these are products that hold water in the stool and make it harder for the colon to pull that water out and back into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So those are good things. And then really, really paying attention 
to your stool habit. I think your grandmother tells you you should poop every day. Well, you probably really should poop every day because that keeps you uh, always moving out that stool while it's still soft and easy to pass. I think as a population, we tend to sometimes ignore the call to stool, those little squeezy feelings in our, our tummy that tell us it's time to go to the bathroom. But we really shouldn't because that's when our body is ready to help us. And I also think exercise is important because exercise and moving those skeletal muscles keeps the, the smooth muscles in the intestine moving too. So those are all very positive things that people can do to reduce the risk of constipation. And those are very simple things, mm -hmm. drinking yes. extra fluids, a little exercise, mm -hmm. eating more fruits and vegetables to get extra fluids and to be high in fiber. Um, what about people who have chronic constipation mm -hmm. and maybe some of these maintenance, you mentioned Miralax, they aren't working anymore. Are there any new mm -hmm. therapies to help people you know, relieve constipation that they may be experiencing? There are some old therapies and some new par therapies. Um, sometimes the careful and, and very short-term use of a true stimulant laxative like Senna mm -hmm. um, can help people overcome a period where they're unusually constipated. They want to continue the Miralax and that hydrating, that hydrating product and, and good fluid intake but that laxative can give them a little bit of extra push to get over that problem. And for adults, there is a new drug called lubaprostone mm -hmm. that has been tested in a small population of cystic fibrosis adults and was very helpful in increasing their frequency of stooling and keeping them less constipated. So I do think we're making a little bit of progress in an old problem um, as time goes forward. So I have to ask, because it's so in the news and you see it on commercials, what about probiotics in people with cystic mm -hmm. fibrosis? Do we know enough? Might it be helpful? Probiotics are a fascinating subject. Um, they've been around as, a, as an interest for a long time, but it's only been in the last few years that we've had products that were so reliable that we felt that the research was really meaningful. Mm -hmm. Your intestine is full of bacteria. You want those bacteria to be good, healthy bacteria that don't do you harm and actually do positive things for you. Um, I think that the hard part is that it's a very, very complicated um, environment. We call it the microbiome uh, living inside you in your intestine. And it's been hard to show that any one organism added to this very, very complex microbiome can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. There are a very small number of studies in cystic fibrosis a couple that suggests that using probiotics may actually improve the, the bacteria in the lung. Mm -hmm. And then there's one very small study suggesting that probiotics might reduce inflammation in the GI tract that holds some promise um, for the future. But I think part of this is we need a lot more studies and part of it is we need to really understand the bacteria in the mm -hmm. intestine a lot better than we do right now. Yeah. A number of people registered and asked, um, why is constipation more of a problem when they have a pulmonary exacerbation or lung infection? Why does that happen? It's, it's always hard to say for sure, but many times when people get ill, mm -hmm. um, people who have CF and people who don't have CF, their intestinal motility, the speed at which their intestine moves and the smoothness with which their mm -hmm. intestine moves tends to slow down. Um, also, particularly in CF, when you have a lung exacerbation, a lot more fluid is being utilized in breathing and, and sometimes with fever in sweating. Mm -hmm. And so it, there may be a tendency for the intestine to both slow down and for the stool to get dehydrated, both of which would tend to increase constipation. So how seriously should people with CF and parents take constipation? How serious of a problem can it become? I think because constipation is so common in the general population, we tend to forget that sometimes it can cause tremendous pain. Enough pain that people won't eat the way they should eat, or they can't do the things that they want to do. And in very small children, a large bolus of stool in the, in the colon can really push against the stomach and perhaps make it harder for, for a very small child to eat. Mm -hmm. So I think anything that causes you that much distress should be taken seriously. And um, I think that people should be willing to talk to their doctor, particularly their cystic fibrosis doctor, who can usually direct them um, to a good place to go to get some help.
So let's switch a little bit. We've talked sure. about constipation. Now let's talk about intest intestinal blockage mm -hmm. and distal DIOS. D -I -O -S. Um, why are, explain intestinal blockage, why are people with cystic fibrosis prone to it, and what is DIOS? Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would say is that it's very hard to say why DIOS occurs mm -hmm. in, in people with CF. Um, we, we're struggling to look at that. Um, people have done studies trying to find a genetic background, uh, but we, we really don't have clear answers. Mm -hmm. We know that some of the risk factors in cystic fibrosis are that, uh, again, the intestine is somewhat dehydrated. The mucus that lines the intestine that helps the stool move along is quite dehydrated. Um, the motility of the intestine, those those careful movements of the intestine don't seem to be as rapid in cystic fibrosis. And then there's always the presence of undigested food in the GI tract in someone with CF. Mm -hmm. We like to think that our pancreatic enzymes are perfect, but they're, they're not. Um, so even people who are very, very careful and do a very good job with their pancreatic enzymes still have a little bit of undigested food in their GI tract. All of these things tend to predispose some people, but not all people, mm -hmm. to develop a large block of stool that, that gets caught up right where the small intestine and the large intestine come together in the right lower quadrant. Mm -hmm. And that's distal intestinal obstruction syndrome. So what symptoms would somebody have with DIOS? People with um, uh, DIOS usually experience symptoms over a very short period of time, usually days or at, or at, much a, uh, at, much a, at most, excuse me, a week. Um, they should have generally pain and distension. Sometimes the pain is localized to that right lower quadrant. Mm -hmm. And often people who are experiencing an episode of DIOS can actually feel a mass in that right lower quadrant when they put their hand down there. Mm -hmm. A lot of patients come in and say, I can feel something down there, what is that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so how can a person prevent DIOS? Sometimes, it, assuming it's preventable. Right, sometimes you can't prevent it, but the best thing to do is to, again, maintain really good hydration, um, keep drinking a lot of fluid, particularly in hot weather, mm -hmm. particularly if you're exercising heavily, and so in both cases you're losing a lot more fluid. Mm -hmm. um, take your pancreatic enzymes as religiously as possible. Try not to miss them with any meals. Um, and I think when, you're, when you know that you're having a, a pulmonary exacerbation, when you're becoming ill, you need to try to step up that fluid intake, and if you're having trouble with that, you need to talk to your CF doctor about that. So um, what symptoms, we've talked about constipation, we've talked about DIOS or mm -hmm. intestinal blockage. What symptoms, what are the flags that a person with CF or a family member or a parent should be aware of to mm -hmm. call and talk to their doctor when it comes to GI symptoms? Right, I think that sometimes people wait too long to call their doctor. Mm -hmm. They don't want to wake them up at night or they're, they think this is something that's going to go away, but it's always good to ask questions. So I think if you're having severe pain that prevents you from doing the things that you normally do or that you want to do, mm -hmm. um, if you're vomiting repeatedly, if you have blood in your stool or when you vomit you see blood in what you vomited, um, if you're having a fever that really isn't explained by your lung disease, or if you're nauseated so badly that you can't eat for a day or two. I think those are times when you need to get on the phone and, and call your CF center and start with them and ask questions. Oh, that's good to know. So how can people with CF um, find uh, a gastroenterologist, a specialist? Uh, how, do, how do they find a local specialist or where can they look? Well, one way is to call your CF center and ask, ask your, your center doctor who is the gastroenterologist who works mm -hmm. with their center. Um, but there's also resources for both pediatric gastroenterologists and adult gastroenterologists. The uh, North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition mm -hmm. um, has a website, www.gastrokids.org, and on that website you can find a pediatric gastroenterologist in any state of the union. Uh, for adults, we have the American Gastrointestinal Association, mm -hmm. and they have a similar find a doctor system um, for adult gastroenterologists. Okay, so the last question, 
and kind of standard is what research is happening related to cystic fibrosis in the GI tract? I think that this is a very exciting area because we, we've had for a long time small numbers of studies going on in uh, people with cystic fibrosis, but they've been uh, a little bit limited because of the complexity mm -hmm. of the GI tract. But now we have some really nice models of cystic fibrosis in animals. Um, and these models have, in many ways, a lot more GI disease than they do pulmonary mm -hmm. disease. And that's given us an opportunity to study GI disease in CF in ways we really couldn't. Um, the mouse model has provided a tremendous amount of information about um, small bowel overgrowth and uh, the motility of the intestine and cystic fibrosis. And I think we'll see even more studies coming out of the, the new pig model as time goes forward. Well, that's very hopeful news. And this mm -hmm. has been very interesting. Thank you very much, Sarah Jane. You can learn more about pancreatic enzymes and other information about staying healthy with cystic fibrosis on the Foundation's website. You can also read the CF care guidelines related to nutrition and GI in the treatment section, section under CF care guidelines, subsection nutrition and GI. Many of these guidelines are also published in the medical journals. I would like to thank you for watching this CF Education Day webcast on constipation and DIOS and cystic fibrosis. Sarah Jane for answering the great questions and giving us wonderful information. Rick Vast and the technical crew, Melissa Chin, Genentech, and the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation for making this webcast possible. Thank you.